Hello, and welcome back to module two of your hazardous material and dangerous goods training. Um, I guess y'all got through module one if you're here. Um, of course, if you have any questions on that, please let me know. We do have um, a lot we're going over in this session. Uh, again, we're in general awareness part two. So um, we do have two exhibits. I know only one is showing on the board, but I did have another one. Um, one is uh, exhibit number seven on penalties and exhibit number eight on online training. Um, these aren't real critical, but um, so today we're going to concentrate um, really on where am I getting all this material? What is the resource material that we're using and you need to know about? Uh, the responsible parties. This is going to be a discussion is really who is responsible for what from the time the goods are manufactured and until they're received at their final destination and are actually used in production somewhere. We'll talk about training. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a procedural manual, um, penalties, uh, record keeping and document retention. So it's a lot of information. But before we get started, we did talk last time that I did make a mistake. I didn't have everything in front of me and I told you I'd readdress it on this one. So before it gets stuck into your head too much, uh, we had we talked about segregation in a container and that's pretty important to y'all. Um, what I did was on your last email, I sent you an update on the exhibits and um, a few other things, but the exhibits I did upgrade, update the segregation in a container, so you knew what those letters or symbols in the columns meant. Um, the, in basic terms, if there's nothing in there, that means it's okay to ship with that other product. Remember, we're cross-sectioning two commodities going into the same container. Um, if it has a zero or an O, they have to be separated from each other so that in case there's an incident, they won't, if there's a leak, it won't come in contact with the other product. Um, and then if there's an X, it means they can't be shipped together. So at first sight, it looks like there's a lot of X's, but a lot of that is class one materials. The good news is um, the commodities y'all are using don't really have any restrictions on segregation in a container. Um, for example, the um, struts that are a class 2.2, uh, which is a non-flammable gas. If you look in that column right around the top and you come down and compare it to, first of all, class nines aren't even on there. They can be mixed with anything, but y'all do move a few threes and the three is blank and y'all do occasionally move, well, you do move the batteries, which is a class eight. Um, and so um, those can't be, um, I mean, those can be, so there is nothing in that column either. So look at your 2.2s. All you have to worry about is your um, explosives. If you do those and the explosives you have to worry about are 1.5s and 1.1 or 2. Um, you do have some 1.4, so there's no restriction there. Um, so you probably won't need this, but if you do get commodities that aren't on our list that, that we show as being hazardous in your facility, Right now, exporting them out, there's not a problem, um, especially with the CCUSA group. So just kind of wanted to um, update you on that before I jump into today. Again, um, I will be going over it in the review. I did send out um, an email, so hopefully you'll be able to make some of those review, review classes. So let's talk about the resources that we're using. Um, we are, we are, this is all, uh, this training is based on moving goods domestically and moving goods via ocean. Uh, some of y'all will be taking a separate IATA class um, on, on those modules. So um, that has a whole different set of regulations, but each set of regulations has about, as I mentioned, a thousand pages. Um, here, I have the master reg. I don't know if it really shows up or not. I'm on one of those like fake background things. So, um, but you should have one of those in your facility. And we also have the IMDG code, which is for ocean shipping. 
So um, let's talk about the 49 CFR. And that's kind of my backbone baby as far as what I go to for regulations. So uh, the 49 CFR, which CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations, if you're not sure, they do cover all the US domestic regulations. And it is um, put together by the Department of Transportation, or as we all know, DOT. Um, the um, other thing you need to know about that, I guess, is um, the, the, the thing that makes these different um, from others is if there is an incident or there is some infractions of the regulation, it is the government agency responsible for hazardous materials in the country uh, of each country that is responsible. So that's why our 49 CFR is important because it contains things like penalties and what has to be done here. Um, the IMDG code, oh, and the other thing, the 49 CFR, it comes out every single year. As a matter of fact, it comes out on November 1st each year. Sometimes it's delayed in printing. Uh, I will give the um, people who is responsible at Mercedes um, a list of where they can get the resource materials and what they really need. So you should know where one is, um, a 49 CFR especially. Um, so the other is the IMDG code, which IMDG stands for International Maritime Dangerous Goods. Um, it is the International Ocean Regulations, and it is um, written in conjunction with IMO, the International Maritime Organization. Um, the IMDG is one I like to read when I sort of don't know something about a new type product or something because it's written in good, simple English that is used worldwide, where the 49 CFR is written in government regulations. So, um, so if I'm like wanting to read a little bit more about limited quantities or specific on some labeling requirements, I go to the IMDG first and get a really good understanding of what to do. Most of the regulations match in 49 CFR, and then I just basically go to the 49 CFR and look up the details, see if anything might be different. Um, the IMDG code comes out every two years. So it is coming out in 2020. I do believe it's available. I haven't ordered my copies yet for that. Um, so what I had and showed you was the 2018 edition. So those are the actual books. Um, the good thing is, is the 49 CFR is completely available online. You can just uh, Google anything, just the letters HMT and you're gonna have uh, the um, H is the hazardous, hazardous material table, but you can look up um, USA hazardous regulations or 49 CFR, and you can read the actual regulations and they are kept current throughout the year. So um, the IMDG unfortunately is not available online. You can find copies that are previous years, but those are a little bit dangerous because when I was doing some of the research, I was surprised at some of the changes in the commodities that you do handle. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to automotive parts, but lithium ion batteries have been a hot topic. Safety devices and seatbelt pretensioners didn't used to be called that. They um, used to be um, called you know, airbags. And then you've got struts, which are pressurized articles or articles pressurized. Um, they used to be called different things too. So there's actually been a lot of changing, kind of keeping up with the way that things are manufactured and processed because a lot of these materials uh, didn't have their own specific UN number, identification number previously. And um, so they, they've really taken a look and seen what the real hazards are here, which of course they aren't really that great. So. So that's the material um, and where you can find it. So we're gonna talk about the responsible parties. And, and when we do this, I like to run through the whole shipment of when it's manufactured all the way through until the final person receives it. And there's a lot of um, people in the supply chain. As you know, that's one of the great things about um, our industry and the part about supply chain and logistics, uh, you either love it or you hate it. 
Um, the thing is, there are a lot of moving parts in the supply chain, and it's important to know exactly who's responsible for what. Um, so, and um, and I'll give you probably a little bit be better definition, I hope, um, for each one. So, we're going to start out because Mercedes isn't actually manufacturing some of these. Um, the batteries may be different um, as they come on. But right now, um, most of the articles that you receive in your facility is manufactured by someone else. You've got suppliers for your struts and your airbags and your seatbelt pretensioners. Um, so you're buying those from someone else. So the person who actually manufactures it is the responsible party to make sure that they determine the classification of these products and whether or not they're considered hazardous or not. So they are what we call the original offerer. And you'll see that term a lot in the 49 CFR because it's someone who's offering. And when I say original, every time someone gives those goods to another person, they become an offerer. So it's really important to know where that chain is on what you're responsible for. So ultimately it's the manufacturer since they're originally offering this they create what the sds which is the safety data sheet and that's a whole section that we'll get to a little bit later on but you should be somewhat familiar with this term you might be more familiar with the term msds which is the material safety data sheet it was renamed in 2015 restructured I still call it an MSDS, um, and you're you're not going to get in trouble for for calling it an MSDS. It's just an acceptable term, also. So the manufacturer, they're the original offerer, and so they give it to probably a truck line, or they can load it directly on a rail. But usually, it's a truck line. So they give the original um, offer the safety data sheet. So they can also prepare the dangerous goods declaration for that particular shipment. So what, you, what usually happens is you'll receive it in your facility or your warehouse, and the handler who receives it in will be checking the documentation upon receipt. And I mentioned that I think in the last module, but this is an important step a lot of companies don't train their employees uh, very well on. And it's not like they have to learn a lot. Remember our training is based on function specific. So it is important for them to see that if they get a set of documents and a manifest or bill of lading for that truck, and it doesn't show any hazardous goods on it, yet goods start coming off of there and they see hazardous labels, they need to know something's wrong. Because once it's received in the, your facility, you then take possession of it and you now become the next offerer and become more responsible for that information. The same goes to they start, uh, they've got a, a manifest and, or bill of lading that shows that um, there is supposed to be hazardous goods there. So they have a class nine and they're watching everything unload and they don't see a class nine on anything. So if the uh, manufacturer forgot to label it, forgot to mark it correctly, it needs to be stopped at that point. Um, you're not supposed to be relabeling these things for them unless you get express written um, permission to do so. And even that's a little bit dangerous. So um, and then in the warehouse, they'll they'll get it. They'll go stack it to be um, put on the shelves and into the right skew so that it can be repackaged later on, I believe is how a lot of it works. Or it could be sent into the supply area where it will be delivered to the actual assembly line. So the person who transported on the forklift, again, they need to be hazardous trained because they need to know especially that things have the proper markings on them, and if there's an incident, what should they do? You know, they drop a pallet of class nine, you know, airbags. Probably not, you don't have to turn around and call the fire department right away. Yet, if they're unloading a pallet of liquid, flammable liquids and drums um, that are going into the facility and those tip over, yeah, you might need to call somebody or at least your safety department of, of getting them there and knowing what to do. So 
then it's on the shelf and then you're going to what I believe a lot of uh, they're either put on the assembly line in, in, in plant one, I believe, but in plant two, a lot of the, I'm not plant two, um, CCUSA, they are then repackaging these uh, before they go out for export. So the person who's repackaging, they need to know about marks and labels. Um, and 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 how they're applied and what is the proper what what proper packaging material that you need to to actually choose and i believe mercedes has a whole packaging department that makes that determination and provides those so those, those always have to be kept up to date to make sure that the instructions that are in the system on how to package something um the people handling it are trained to be able to have that awareness and like i said they don't need full training they need some function specific training and i'll talk about that in the training so um the person marking the packages applying the labels they need to be trained i, I i've seen it firsthand that um some aren't in the facility um and they don't realize some of the little idiosyncrasies of how you have to apply labels or where certain markings have to be on the package. And that has to be really clear um, and make sure that they're trained on that. Um, the shipping department, they're the ones who actually prepare the dangerous goods declaration. And for what I, I understand for um, the CCUSA operation, uh, Snellica does that for the MBUSI, if they have something going out, I'm not, I believe Schnellica is also doing that too and um, supplying it for the uh, return goods, which are damaged or defective. Um, and they go to the shipping department in the plant and um, Schnellica provides, I believe, the dangerous goods declaration for those goods also. So we'll talk about shipping papers. That's a whole separate module. Um, so the, sh the shipping department, they need to be trained on these. They also prepare the shipping papers, which could be the instructions for an ocean bill of lading, instructions for the truck line, um, instructions for the railroad. Those are all considered um, shipping papers. Um, they provide placards to the actual truck line or the railroad. So they know how to have to pick placards and which placards are used and the numbers that are used depending on the conveyance. So shipping department has a lot because they are the ones it's going outside the facility so other people are seeing it. So it's really important that they get that shipping paper um, basics on what they need to be trained. The importer or exporter, which that would be Mercedes, um, they have to provide the emergency response information. Now they can do it two ways. A lot of them on the import side when you're bringing or from suppliers, they use the emergency response information provided by the manufacturer. And if you do that, you just have to have the manufacturer's permission to be able to do that. Um, sometimes they do. It's my understanding that um, CCUSA has their own number. I know Plant One has another number um, that they use. There are, um, and we'll talk about emergency response information a little bit later on, but knowing what you're supposed to put on because someone's got to be available 24 seven and your company has designated a company to do this for them. So, and then you've got the, um, Behind the shipping department, they're usually using an imp, uh, a forwarder or custom broker. So what, and that's where our job falls in on a lot of these. And it's, um, we verify all the documents. So we have a safety data sheet usually, we have a dangerous goods declaration, we have a bill of lading, whether by air, ocean or truck. And we make sure all that information matches plus what we have in our database that's been provided by Mercedes and CCUSA. So we're the ones that catch that, oh, looks like somebody did a typo on this one document and put a packing group three instead of a packing group two. Well, you wanna catch that before it gets to the person you're shipping it with, either the truck line, which they do miss a lot of these because you've got a driver checking this information nothing against drivers love them 
or um, but if it gets to the steamship line or an airline, they are really picky about this. And um, you know, they they will reject a shipment right away, and they you might have a truck sitting there at a port or an airport, and they won't accept the goods because the documents don't match. So usually, all of this is done and filed before the shipment's even picked up by the truck line. Um, and then what the forwarder does also is they submit shipping instructions to the ocean carrier. And that all has to be correct. We give them the dangerous goods declaration at time of booking, and then we provide them with shipping instructions so they can complete the ocean bill of lading um, between the goods being shipped and the goods actually being received at the port. So there's a little window there that we have to do that also. So, but we check all those documents beforehand um, and, and hopefully if there's anything out there, we find it. Um, honestly, once, once you get it, um, preparing the shipping papers are really simple, but you have to get it. This is where we always recommend people to use templates, use things of shipments that you've done before that you know are correct. So I'll talk about that a little bit in the um, procedure manual and retention of some documents. So, um, and then the last one you've got is you've got the carrier which or transporter, which is either the ocean carrier or the truck line or railroad. They're the ones that actually apply the placard to the conveyance. So um, you have to give them the right placard. Um, Sometimes uh, companies agree that your shipping department may decide, you know what, we want to make sure it's done right. So we're applying the placards to the containers before the truck even pulls up. That's perfectly fine also. Um, but ultimately it is the carrier who, um, the, the transport of the motor carrier who's responsible to do that. Um, and in containers, a little bit different they usually the um, shipper which is say mercedes or ccusa they'll usually apply those placards because you're loading the container and you're putting it on your yard and more than likely the trucker is picking it up in some kind of drop and pick move so they receive the dangerous goods declaration they usually ask for the safety data sheet Probably not every time. Once you have a commodity, uh, like we don't ask our customers every time. We have a filing system. It's all electronically now that we can look up specifically any UN number and find the safety data sheet for our particular customer. Uh, make sure we have something that's up to date. Um, and then you've got, um, they are checking the shipping papers. So they're making sure of all those three checks. So usually before the goods get to the airport or to the ocean port, you know, you've got someone internally checking it, the forwarder is checking it, and the truck line is checking it. So hopefully you'll get this all right before the goods are actually turned in. So you got a little bit of time to play with it there. So, um, the, the, and just so you know, the motor carrier, you may, the document you give them are their instructions so they complete their official transport document. Like you may think you're preparing the bill of lading for the truck line, but really that bill of lading is as instructions to the truck line. They put it in their own system and create their own bill of lading. So, and the other thing that you have to make sure is that carriers, um, the truck lines, they have to have an emergency response guide in their truck. Um, same as on ships, on planes, it just gives, tells them what to do in case there's an incident. And we'll talk about the, that one a little bit later. So those are your parties that are involved in here. As you can see, there's quite a few of them. Um, and, you know, you can even um, have more you know, in, in logistics and, and in supply chain. Um, I always get surprised at the number of people that are actually involved in a transaction to move it from one place to another. So those are your parties, general information. Um, you should be good on that. So probably there'll be a question on that area somewhere. I'm not really sure where something's gonna come, but your responsible parties, I'm sure there's a question gonna be coming out of there somewhere. So, all right, so let's talk about training. This is what you're doing. Um, your training is um, certain things that you need to have in your training 
Um, first of all, there's general awareness. That's what we're going through on the first module and the second module. And those, like you said, it's just a little general knowledge of you understanding just the world of hazardous materials, and it is important. So you should be able to, in general awareness, you should be able to spot something in your facility that's labeled with a hazardous label, as you've seen those diamonds probably, and some of you may wonder what they are. Um, you have the little green labels of the non-flammable gas that you have out there for your struts, um, but there's other ones out there too. Y'all do a little bit of flammable um, that's used in the plant. So that could be um, a red label that you see out there. Um, and then your corrosives, your, um, what is it? Corrosives and uh, miscellaneous class nines, class eights. Those are both black and white. Those aren't as much fun to see or whatever, but um, you just need to be aware that it's out there. And then just a little bit that there are regulations. There are things that you need to be doing as far as record keeping and documentation, things like that. Um, so then we get into function specific, and this is going to cover a lot of y'all on what you're gonna to need to know on your function, but there is more. If you're doing more and you're saying, you know what? He spent like 15 minutes and that's my whole eight hour job. And I'm not sure if I really know all of this. Well, what this is supposed to do is to encourage you to read a little bit. When you go into certain areas of mark and you're like, okay, this is my area. Maybe I need to read the whole thing on marking in the 49 CFR or IMDG and see if it matches up to what I'm doing and I really understand it. Like I said, um, the regulations seem big and thick, but usually you, when you find the place that you're looking for about what you're doing, it's almost all on one page. So you're not looking at having to read a 40 page chapter on something because a lot of the details are in the exceptions of things and um, strange mixtures of things or compatibility of things. And like I said, y'all really don't have that issue in your facilities. And like I said, recognize and identifying hazardous materials. Um, you know, you need, you, you need to be able to see it. Um, even if it's simple things of knowing, you know what? that's got a long chemical name and I can't pronounce it. And my rule is if I can't pronounce it, that means I should look it up just to see if it's hazardous or not. So you may see some chemicals come through. Some can be, you might have some cleaning compounds, some oils and lubricants in the plant that you use. Depending, you could be buying them in a small quantity or individual packets that aren't considered hazardous on their own. But if you're bringing them in in 55 gallon drums, they may be hazardous. So <clears throat> that's what's kind of called some of the hidden hazardous commodities out there that people don't even realize that they have. And then of course, knowing your emergency response information and what do you do in case there's an incident. So that should be posted your emergency response information of who you call. You know, you're internally in your plant, maybe they have an internal number that you call, you pick up the phone and you call some kind of 911 for a hazardous incident or some kind of code and it immediately goes to that office and they take over from there. Or there can be other type emergency response informations that you have. Um, I would get with your hazardous department and just make sure you have that wherever there are hazardous goods in your facility a little sign there of saying in case of an incident or in case of questions, call this number immediately. Not DOT, um, if they ever come in to inspect the facility, they like seeing signs like that. So, so training, when do we train? Well, the, the, the honest answer is when you're handling hazmat, you should already be trained. So under the 49 CFR, it's pretty nice. You get um, 90 days from the day of your employment um, in order to be trained or direct supervision until you're trained. So if you are directly being supervised, um, you may not need, you may not need the three people working on putting boxes, packages together and they're loading hazmat in these particular boxes and putting the marks. If there's a supervisor there, someone who is trained, giving specific instructions on what to do, that's the only person that needs to be trained. That's understandable. 
It's advised though that you probably should get them a little bit training beforehand. Um, recurrent training every three years for ocean and trucking. So any kind of um, notice yeah, that you're trained with me, you'll get a notice from me probably about three months before um, you're due for being um, recertified and to get um, recurrent training. Uh, we can set that up. Recurrent training is a lot easier. You don't have to go over everything with it and it takes about half the time. Um, and then if there's any regulatory changes, and again, this should be from your hazmat department there, they should be looking at, you know, if, um, you know, airbags used to be considered a 1.4 explosive, they were reclassified as a class nine. Well, you need to be updated on something like that. If you wonder that out of nowhere, the labels on the goods have changed, uh, you know, that you're used to seeing, that should be a red flag. You should have already know about those regulatory changes. Um, our government's usually pretty good. They give us at least a year. A lot of times they give us up to five years, just so that if people have any supplies and they run dual regulations. The IMDG is a lot lighter on what they're training. They just say that training needs to be done based on someone's job function. So, they're just saying that, you know, once you move there um, and you've got a specific job function that has no supervision, um, then you need to be trained. So pretty simple um, on the training initial 90 days recurrent every three years. So so if um, on the next one, we've got um, it's um, exhibit number eight. And all it is is really a copy from a page that's an online page. You've got a website there that DOT, they do offer online training. It's totally free. It doesn't get you certified, but it does give you that general awareness and it does get into some detail on some things. So it's got one just on the hazardous material table, one on shipping paper, one on markings, one on placarding, one on labels. Um, those are really good if you've got someone specific that you say, okay, let me give you a little bit of general awareness here, um, but then I want you to watch these videos. If, if you kind of don't get it and you, 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 they think that they need to go to that next step of being certified, um, they can do that. But that's a great program internally as I know y'all have safety videos there. Um, things like that, that you have to do every um, certain amount of time. This is a great thing to um, put into your program there for all your employees working with anything remotely that is hazardous. So um, it just gives you a good due diligence of getting people training in there. They're interactive. It's free. You just have to sign up for it. Um, you go through the course. If you stop the course, the next time you sign on, you go right back into it. It's got a lot of little exercises in it. And at the end, you take a test and it tells you whether or not you pass. If you don't pass, you just re-sign up for the course and you can go back and go through the fields real quickly and just get to the point where maybe you missed or didn't understand and then work on that. So um, highly recommend the free online training. There's the website right there. So the uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is something that you may not be responsible for, but you kind of need to know that there, there is one out there. I know there's a big, Dommler manual that's being created and some detail on some things and uh, part of that is that they have to comply with their country's regulations and this is Dommler making a worldwide one so they can't make one procedure manual that covers all countries because each country are a little bit different so but this is some of the things that they're going to have to be looking into um, into a procedure manual um, they have to outline the training policy that's just one of those, and it, it's not as easy as it thinks of who should be trained and who's who's not. You've got to go through every position in the facility, and if they're touching hazardous goods, they need some kind of training, and they have to mark that and keep up with that. And you're talking about a lot of people in your facility that would have to do that. And then they need to require for each position what needs specific training. 
So they can determine that they want everyone trained on everything generally and just a little bit on their function specific, or they can just create one. They have to keep these training records, like the, all this information we have on here, that they have to have a copy. We maintain that copy in case you ever need them. Any of the training materials, that's why when you're kind of done with this and you pass your test and get your certificate, you should have somewhere a scan if you printed this or having it somewhere in a folder that says hazmat training 2020 and you show um, the training materials, the presentations, the exhibits I sent you, the test, your answer sheet, my, and your certification that you'll receive when this is done when you pass the test, which will be an actual certificate. Um, and I'll give it to you in a scan form and you'll get an actual hard copy of it. So, um, and then um, again, your um, emergency response number policy, um, that needs to be in your procedure manual. They need to be clear on that. Um, I know there was some question, I know when CCUSA started up about, you know, when is everybody Mercedes and when is each facility different? And when they said facility, it could be in each building. So, and depending on what the commodities are there. So each one, each of your buildings could have a different emergency response number based on kind of what it costs to cover that. Um, you need to have a safety data sheet policy. When you receive the safety data sheet or you create a safety data sheet for any of the products that are in your facilities, where are they kept? What is the requirement for getting them? Do you get them before they come in your facility? Do you get them when they're received in your facility? Um, you just need a policy for that. Um, DOT yearly registration. Every year, um, anyone who offers goods for transport of hazardous goods has to be registered with the Department of Transportation. Um, I believe Mercedes definitely is. I know y'all are in Vant. It covers CCUSA. It's the whole company. Um, so, but it's like $2,600 a year for something like that. So um, that has to be done. DOT uses that for their training and things. Um, the other thing is, is examples of shipping papers. And, and I'll talk about this when we get to shipping papers, but I can't emphasize this enough that you're doing the same commodities over and over and over again, shipping to the same places, receiving from the same places. Um, you should have an example of all of those in some kind of place where you keep them, probably electronically on the folder that is, you know, you could have one that says, you know, shipping department SDS, and under there, you might have it by commodity. You might have it by UN number. You can have one that says, you know, UN 3264, UN 3168. You might have one that says UN 3164 and UN 3168, meaning that both of those went on the same shipping paper. And you've got an example of where it was done right. And once you get it right and it's been accepted, you can use that. There are fillable forms out there that you can go in and just alter certain things on each shipment. Of course, you have to be real careful when you copy, but you can make a good solid template for all of these where all you're doing is going in and putting in the actual number of pieces. If the packaging type, which you all are pretty much the same every time, and the different gross and net weight, and everything else will already be on there. You don't have to worry about, do I have the right... Um, emergency response number. Do I did I put it on my document? Did I did I um, fill out the signature blocks correctly? Um, all that'll be pre-done. So highly recommend that also. And then what your security plan is. And because I am pretty sure security and safety is a pretty big thing at y'all's facility. Um, Y'all have your own security and safety plans. I've been to your facility. I know that. So. Um, it just needs your hazardous procedure manual need, basically needs to say that they comply with the standards of the so-and-so safety plan or security plan of MBUSI, you know, at your facility or whatever. So that's not a problem um, um, at all for something like that. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, penalties. 
Um, and when we talk about penalties, um, they're issued by the government governing agents of each country. For the USA, it's the PHMSA, which is the Pipeline Hazardous Material Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, which DOT falls under there, and so does FAA for any air shipments. So penalties can range from you've got it, your exhibit number seven there that you should, could be looking at um, with that, and they can range anywhere from five hundred dollars to thirty thousand dollars and up per incident. Um, shipments can be assessed multiple penalties. If you get the UN number wrong, you got it all wrong basically because you're going to have the um, proper shipping name wrong, probably the packing group wrong, probably the class wrong, the wrong markings because you started with the wrong piece of information. You can get a penalty for every one of those items if the marks aren't correct, if they're not in the right place, if you don't have orientation arrows on it. They fall in, like I said, small to big. You offer a hazardous goods of a packing group one, which is the most severe or dangerous goods that have the greatest danger. Um, you offer one of those for transportation without shipping papers, then you've got a problem there because um, that's one of the highest penalties out there because they're the, big, the um, uh, biggest um, thing that you can get penalized. So on your exhibit, I list a few of them in the beginning of what they are. They're kind of some of the big ones, and then it starts getting down to the shipping papers. So it's going to be important for you to keep that exhibit. That's right, because it's probably going to be something there on the test. Um, the other thing I like to say about penalties, and I'm not sure if I covered it in number one, but, you know, um, the um, reason that we do all this correctly and we get training and we figure out how to handle these things and we make sure the documents are right, it's really all for safety. And I can tell you that um, I have had a shipment before which I handled for hazardous and I issued some um, shipping papers that were for the goods. It was for an evergreen container leaving the port in Charleston. When I got home that night on the news, there was an uh, evergreen container that was turned over on the interstate right in a busy section of town that was leaving the town area. Ended up there was an inhalation hazard in that container um, and areas needed to be evacuated. Now, I didn't know that at first, so I'm sitting there at home nervous of whether or not I did the shipping papers right and if that was my container or not. And um, I, I kind of committed the next day that I really got involved with hazardous. And that was over 30 years ago. And I have become our go-to hazardous guy for the last 30 years because I, I'm used to the regs. I got into it. I realized the importance of it. Um, we did actually, it wasn't my shipment, by the way, thank goodness, but we have, I have handled a shipment of an inhalation hazard that was in a warehouse facility where it would be consolidated with other goods, and it was in a glass container, re, you know, um, enforced three times, and it was dropped, and it was actually leaked. They actually did have to evacuate a half mile radius of that facility to be safe, and it was around five o'clock in the afternoon. So it was horrible. Um, it was just the mistake and fault. They got it under control. It was fine. But, you know, there's certain commodities which are really bad <coughs> things. So, and that's just something you don't want your name on. Even if nothing happened and a container overturned on the way to the rail and it flipped over and there's placards on the side and the news gets out there. It's going to be all over the news that Mercedes had a container with hazardous goods flip over. It's our understanding that the documentation did not declare it as hazardous. More news on this when we get more. And they're going to go into every scenario because they know nothing about hazardous goods and really that those class nine really didn't pose any kind of risk to anybody. But they will be out there telling everybody because, you know, the news does like to hype up that. So, um, so penalties, we do them for safety.
But yeah, they can be a slap on the hand. Most of the time when you get something that it's like, you know, a word may be spelled wrong, except for the proper shipping name. You want to be real careful on that. But you get something maybe just slightly off. Usually you'll get a slap on the hand from DOT if they catch it the first time and they'll give you a warning. Um, but they're not going to give you a warning if you ship something that was hazardous without any kind of paperwork whatsoever, more than likely. Um, and I don't know if y'all are either going to be earmarked for a DOT inspection or not for hazardous. Uh, we've only been, our company has been doing hazardous since we began 70 years ago. And we've only been in my 30 years doing this for hazardous is we've been inspected twice. And both times it was within two weeks after we shipped an inhalation hazard, which I told you was really bad stuff releases in the air people can it's toxic people can get sick um, you have to evacuate areas so they do follow up on that they follow up on radioactive shipments of course makes sense and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the classes um, of how yes they're all equal that all paperwork has to be correct but there is a bit of a balance to that scale that um you know certain hazardous classes are really you know Really, really kind of scary when you think about it and you, and you want to do a little extra um, care and caution when you're doing those paperwork. So penalties. Um, hopefully you'll never get one. Um, and we haven't gotten one. Um, and when they come, you, if we were prepared, just so you know, um, we have um, a our procedural manual was already done the first time he came in. He says, Love this manual. It's written exactly like the regs are. I just need to see some shipping papers, uh, examples of shipping papers. And um, he went through those. He pointed out some things that could have been done better. Um, that was at the time when the IMDG and 49 CF rules were kind of combining some of those rules. And we were going by one and not the other. And um, we should have been probably switched over by then, but um, but it was just a little slap on the hand. And um, all he asked is that the next time we did a shipment for that customer, I fax him a copy of a shipping paper showing that it was done correct. Um, nice guy or whatever. Well, uh, I learned from that. So basically I took every class that we do, which is about all of them. And I got an example of a shipping paper. I do it every year. So on at the in December, I try to collect things that were done in the last quarter, one for each class, and I just stick those in my procedural manual for example documents that I can pull out. The other thing I did is we had this little conference room in, and y'all probably can't do this, but just some kind of visibility is good. We had a little conference room um, that was usually used for one-on-one -on -one meetings, maybe up to four at the most, but. Um, kind of like the rooms they have at CCUSA for the little small ones. And um, I had put up one of the charts showing all of the hazard classes, labels, and placards up in that room and um, on the back of the door. So when um, we went in there to meet, the next time he came in, we went in there, I had the procedural manual, different person, shut the door, um, so that was shown when he opens the manual and I had in there a thing that was labeled um, examples of shipping papers and the whole procedural manual. And um, it was one of my favorite times because he looked at it and he goes, you know, you really should sell this manual to companies. He goes, if every company was like this, I'd be in and out in less than five minutes. And he goes, a little bit of gravy on top or the cherry on top is you've got that hazmat chart hanging up. And I said, yeah, we've got like four of them throughout the office uh, of just to remind people of, of hazmat. And um, so it was a little sucking up, but if you know what they want, you do it, you prepare for it, you make sure you're ready for it. Um, I know there's a, an inspection with Domler in the middle of the month. Um, I'm working with my shipping office in plant one to make sure everything's updated. I wanna review everything they did before, so I'm ready to answer those questions a lot quicker. So 
Record keeping, um, your company would um, have to keep all the certified employees' names, the date of their latest certification, the description, copy, or location of training, certification that training has been done. You can do this in a lot of ways. We've done it in our HR program. I also keep a running spreadsheet for me because I can you know, look every quarter of anybody that's coming up that needs to be retrained and give them some time to look at it. Whatever they choose, um, they just need to look at the regulations and make sure that they're keeping their record keeping. So when um, that's the thing that I put in our procedure manual, when I when they call and say DOTs at the front door and I said, great, show them to the conference room. And I go in and I print my updated list of all the employees that have been trained when they're due for training. So and have that printed out so it's up to date. Of course, I do a really quick check in case I didn't update something in the last week or so, but usually it's all up to date. The other thing is document retention. So we've got to keep track of what we've done. We need to be able to show if they come in what's going on. So you need to think about the ocean shipments and things that are going into a warehouse that can be put up on stock shelves, they can be around for a long time. So just because, and those, um, as long as the goods are still there and not delivered to the final destination, but they're still being moved or whatever, there may be, you need that history of how it got in there. So you can keep these in electronic or paper form. I'm sure y'all probably would prefer to do it electronically. Um, shipping papers um, for anything going out, they have to be kept on the premises. So again, electronically is the best place. That's considered part of your premises if you've got um, you know cloud storage and, and you own it. Um, so the shipper maintains records for two years after it's been offered. So kind of a long time. It just needs to kind of go with the set of documents, but um, to be honest, we have to keep all of our records for five years, so it's not that big of a deal. So again, important little part, your shipper maintains records for two years after it's been offered. Now, if you're doing hazardous waste manifest, y'all may have some waste um, things that are, are used that are in the plant. Um, those have to be kept for three years. That's a whole different set of training. Don't have to go into that that much. So, so that's all of our data on this one. Um, again, um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, if you kind of missed something, you had to go out and take a call and you read it over and you don't quite get it, that's perfectly fine too. Remember, I am here to get you through this. I just want to make y'all a little bit smarter, a little bit more aware when it comes to hazardous materials. Because again, you're not going to know it all. It's going to be an on-the-job training of what your function is. And the more you have to do handle hazardous goods or the shipping papers, the better you'll get. You're not going to be perfect the first time, but you get there and you make progress. So a lot of information today, a lot of little places um, there. Um, I, I, I think I kind of pointed out some areas um, knowing that that 49 CFR is um, produced by the Department of Transportation. The IMDG code is by the IMO International Maritime Organization. Um, Important to know that the um, uh, manufacturer is the one that is responsible for creating the initial um, safety data sheet. Your training is every three years. Um, just a little general somewhere in the procedural manual, something will come out about that. Of course, I'm going to pick out a couple of penalties that you probably should know. So I wouldn't say go in and, and study these. Remember, this is a open book test when you take the test um, and like I said it is all multiple choice maybe a couple of true falses in there but um, like I said um, and then again your document retention it really is important to make sure that y'all know you keep your documents for two years after it's been offered so again a lot of information um, but um, we do have a um, um, our review sessions that are live. They're really every day at three o'clock. 
I know I had them label as IATA in different modules, and those are ones that I'm, I might do a quick brief overview during that one. You can come to any one and ask any questions on any module. So don't feel bad, and if it's a lot of stuff, we just take it a little bit longer and we can go over it there, or we can take it offline and do a separate call. Again, I am open to y'all. I am at y'all's disposal for the next couple of weeks. I will be keeping an eye on your training. Um, let me know though, if you're getting behind and you don't think you're gonna be able to do this, um, please let me know. Um, so if I need to extend this or not. Um, so all the other information um, will be updated as we go along the modules. But so that should do it. So, um, Appreciate y'all listening. So last time I let it just run and run and run. So this time I'll try not to do that. So good to see good to see y'all.